Close my space. Okay. Okay, we are now live. Uh, so, hello everyone, and welcome back to the We Think UAV, UGV, uh, unmanned systems, uninhabited systems, all the systems that have some kind of uninhabited before terminology before whatever they are afterwards. And I'm sure there are so many because they keep developing. I can't keep up with the acronyms and whether it's UAV, UGV, UCAV, UNV, U, uh, you know, UAS, CUAS, all that stuff. We talk about it all and we talk about the emerging threats. So in theory, in short, we think uninhabited systems emerging threats would probably be the most accurate term now that but, uh, you know we can change that officially and uh, we discuss with uh, specialists with researchers practitioners manufacturers but mostly researchers practitioners specialists and experts in the field and related fields on the the subjects uh, that's my laundry machine in the background that you might hear uh, on the subjects related to the emerging threats from uninhabited systems. And today we are lucky to have uh, one of our, our, our well-known guests, David Kovar. And if you would mind just giving a quick introduction for those of you who are watching and who haven't been introduced to Mr. Kovar, would you please uh, give a quick introduction? Will do. So my name is David Kovar, a US citizen. Um, I do a lot of UAV. Uh, and counter UAS research. Uh, we do some work for the FAA on UAVs in low altitude national airspace. And I do some presentations occasionally on uh, potential threats posed by autonomous vehicles. Um, and so what you and what we think are doing in terms of looking forward and trying to get a lot of different people thinking about these problems and talking about them, I'm really pleased and honored to have the opportunity to collaborate with you on these things. Well, thank you very much again for coming in, especially on short notice, as per uh, my habit. <laughs> and uh, I apologize. There is a laundry machine that just so happened to start the drying phase uh, right now. So I don't know if you can already hear it, but we may hear it. And it sounds sometimes like a drone. So, it, you know, maybe it'll add to the aesthetic of the conversation. And so today we have a few interesting points we wanted to talk about. And uh, David had mentioned three articles. So uh, I will give my screen a share. Uh, let, me, let me set this up and I will share my screen and we will see screen two and voila. So uh, I'm gonna move this over here. Uh, David, can you see my screen with the articles? Yes, I can. Okay, so I'll go to the beginning. So the first one, the headline, Iran will help Russia build drones for the Ukraine war, Western officials say. So David, what, was, uh, what were your thoughts on this here? My take home from this is that rather than Russia buying a variety of drones from Iran and having them shipped into the country and things like that, that Iran is actually agreeing to help build production capacity within Russia for producing these things. Um, Russia will still have a supply chain issue, but it should allow them to produce them in much greater volumes than they currently can uh, access via directly from Iran. But it also may create opportunities for them to modify them uh, to suit their own purposes. So it'll be interesting to see how these particular drones these particular drones evolve once they are start once they are produced in Russia. And there you go, you can hear the machine. Uh, just scrolling through, do we know have they specifically stated which type of uh, drone this they're sending? Is it this Shadid, article, or this article did not get into the details about timing or about uh, the resources that are going to be allocated or what's going to be built. But I think it's safe to assume that if they start by producing just one single UAV, um, the, the facilities and the processes and procedures and relationships are there that would allow them to produce other UAVs 
uh, much more quickly if that was uh, agreed upon. So, you know, it's interesting because it's kind of like a mirror image of we have Iran providing these UAVs to Russia in their, uh, you know, operation in their invasion in their war with Ukraine. On the Ukrainian side, we have Turkey providing TB tubes. And uh, I think uh, there was an agreement originally between the Russian and Ukrainians that was signed that maybe, I think it must be two, one and a half, two years ago that Ukraine would have the ability to set up a factory and produce its own TB2s locally. And then those TB2s would be built with uh, some Ukrainian products, including an engine, which I think would increase its uh, range and uh, maneuverability, and also allow Ukraine to export those UAVs to virtually any country, so long as those countries they chose to export them to didn't have a pre-existing contract with Turkey. So I, I don't know, I saw something in the news that either of that factory had been completely aside, the infrastructure had been obliterated, that the, the, the deal may have been uh, put on hold or even canceled. I think we discussed this a little bit be before. I'm, I don't know for sure the facts of that situation, but it would be interesting to know because looking at the geopolitical ramifications, if in fact it was canceled, that would be very interesting when we look at what Turkey is pursuing elsewhere and in the MENA region, specifically with Syria, what its designs, as we've seen the recent uh, buildup in Syria uh, for operations in uh, Northern Syria against the SDF or operations in uh, Iraq against the uh, PKK or, uh, you know, to support or, President Erdogan, the current president of Turkey, er Erdogan, uh, his election chances for 2023, because he and Putin and Ru Russia and Turkey have had a uh, very close relationship since the purchase of the S-400 missile systems and the involvement of the Syrian civil war, the involvement with the two in, in Libya, and where Turkey has acted as a sort of relatively neutral player in the war between Russia and Ukraine where the rest of the NATO countries were uh, supporting actively Ukraine. Uh, Turkey had decided to veto and delay any uh, the entrance of Finland and Sweden into NATO, which in a sense could be viewed as not being entirely neutral. But if they were to have canceled that plan, it would be interesting to see why. But yeah, I think to, to this point, I, I think, don't know. I think you touched on a couple of really important and interesting things that we need to follow. Um, so just to start with whether it got canceled or not, I think it's reasonable to assume that any effort to build a TB2 factory in Ukraine would receive uh, missile strikes upon it very promptly. So I think there's a very practical reason for not continuing with that particular project. Um, the nature of neutrality and all these relationships um, is incredibly interesting. And I don't think we're really going to understand the depths of those relationships until well after the war uh, is over, which is hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, you know, it, Turkey trying to strike a balance and being properly neutral, it's a very, very hard line to walk. Um, and yes, they have some leverage. Um, and the nature of the Security Council and the UN contributes to some of the complexities here. Um, but it, following along these threads about who's producing what, where that, where those materials are going, who's allowed to reproduce various systems and things like that is going to be very, very interesting. One of the take homes I have from this is that no matter what direction it ultimately goes and who's producing these systems, most of these systems have sufficient capability for engaging nation state actors at a price point that is significantly lower than essentially similar systems from the United States or some Western allies. There's a lot of really advanced capabilities in some of those US systems, which are not present in these lower cost systems. But 
it may be that all that that unless you are a nation state fighting a nation state you may not need those very expensive itar controlled capabilities and that you know a thirty thousand dollar drone using uh, made using cots components may be sufficient for most of your combat requirements and that is going to be a very interesting thread to follow as we go forward in the next couple of years so I did see an article. It's I don't. It's from Eurasia Times. So Eurasian Times. So I can't comment because I don't know what the credibility rating would be on Eurasian Times. However, it does say. I don't know if you can see my screen again. Uh, is this screen visible? For you? Yep. Yeah, it's all here. Okay. We're good. Okay. Uh, so it says obviously Bioactor Dreams ends for Ukraine. Angry Ankar backs out, out of setting up TB2 factory in war zone reports. So it's saying that the that it may possibly end the, the era of the TB2 in Ukraine might actually end. According, this is Russian from Russian media and social media accounts, but also from the Turk comments from the Turkish company's founder. Uh, uh, so it yeah, seems I, to be. I, I, I think the take home here is that, you know, this is Russian media, but that there are a potentially a variety of factors that don't do, does give it credence and that it would really be helpful to get some uh, potentially less biased reporting in, in terms of the state of play here. And according to this article, it says the two primary reasons are one, uh, the decreasing utility, increasing vulnerability of the drones to Russian air defense and electronic report, rare warfare reported by mainstream Western press since June. Don't know about that per se. I think that could, could be a questionable point. But what more interestingly, there is this idea, uh, the second point they mentioned, a deal struck between uh, Putin and Erdogan to make Turkey into a gas hub, helping the latter realize its dream of a regional powerhouse has played a significant part in declining active Turkish support. And so let, me, let me go back to the first point, though, is that it is quite possible, you know, TB2s are about $2 million each. Um, it is yeah. quite possible that as e, the Russian EW capabilities ramped up and became more effective, that Ukraine was losing TB2s at a greater rate than they could afford to replace them, and that they are more vulnerable to Russian EW than people would like to admit or deal with. And so Ukraine's interest in purchasing TB2s may also have diminished, and that goes back to the focus on, are there lower cost systems that can fill most of the role of the TB2 and that are more, as they say, attritable, that you can afford to lose these things because you can replace them in volume. So two interesting points. Uh, uh, first of all, on the electronic warfare, the second I wanna talk about the, the, this kind of cost, uh, cost versus, uh, the, the cost in the, the weapon and the, wep the cost of the weapon used to destroy that weapon. Right. Uh, I think that's really interesting equation. And I had some interesting conversations about that in, in the last few weeks. Uh, but the first point was, uh, what was the first point I said? I'm sorry, sorry, I forgot. I got excited. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, the EW. So I saw in back in uh, October 2020, I think 20 was it October 2020, the war over Artsakh or the Nagorno-Karabakh region, region between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And Turkey had heavily invested and they had sent a lot of TB2s over there. Uh, it wasn't clear whether they were the same quality of TB2, but there, there was a report that was picked up that, by Reuters that said that there had been claims that Russian electronic warfare had downed at least nine to 10 TB2s. And the system that had downed it was the Belladonna, the Krakut, Krak, I can't pronounce it, but if you type in Belladonna, Russian uh, uh, electronic warfare system, EWS, uh, it'll come up. It's, a, it's a, basically a tank with the dome on it. And uh, it was interesting to see because uh, I thought that in this war, the TB2s, if they were able to manage them in if that was true, that claim was true, 
in Armenia and Azerbaijan. And then I read a little bit more about Russian electronic warfare and that they had, they had continued to invest and develop in it since the fall of the Soviet Union, whereas the US had deprioritized it and they're supposed to be known as very, having very strong ele uh, electronic warfare system programs and had continued, uh, continued doing so. But what's interesting is I, I hadn't actually heard anything. So this is just based on my opinion that that Russia was downing uh, TB2s. Uh, but so then again, this media, I, this- I, I think it's reasonable to assume that Russia was downing TB2s in that conflict. And we know through open source reporting and tracking um, that Russia was successfully downing TB2s in Ukraine as well. And I think it's reasonable to assume that as the battle lines sort of hardened up along a sort of Russian front rather than this projection of sort of chaotic Russian assets punched in towards Kyiv, that Russia got their EW uh, much more effective and that that was probably resulting in more TB2s going down and Ukraine's decision, I would, I would, I'm guessing, that to not deploy these $2 million systems if really they their survival rate was relatively low. Um, so anyhow, I think that I think digging into how effective is a TB2 really against Russian um, systems is an uh, interesting question. And to go back to where we started, um, if the TB2 is not effective against Russia, um, I'm certainly I'm certain that Ukraine's not necessarily interested in investing in that relationship. And the, to the geopolitical point that you raised, um, Turkey's trying to walk this neutral line and, you know, gas and other energy sources come into co the conversation. And there's, I, I, the fact that that deal, that deal being canceled seems more likely than not. Yeah, and I imagine uh, given all of the events around the, the situation in Syria and in Iraq that, and I, I, I follow the Turkish elections and up until recently, Erdogan had been doing worse in the polls in, in almost decades. And the opposition to him was the strongest and most united it had been in the 20 years that he had been in power. So I imagine that He's starting to think we have the election in 2023. We need to start pulling all of our forces together to get the polls back in our favor and secure the 2023 elections. And yep. I would imagine that's a big factor in maybe this. If this is a if this is a cancellation of that deal, that could also be another factor in it. Very well. Uh, the second the second point about the cost, I'll, I'll hold off till the end because I just want I want to keep going through the articles you you mentioned uh, because I, it's all I think it's it's all connected. Yeah, this one I found I mean, this one's very interesting, and I haven't found a lot of supporting material that says conclusively that this is what happened. But Yahoo News is saying that Russia paid Iran for the drones, not just in cash but in captured Western weapons. And the, the interesting point for me here is, not, is that we've all been worrying about where Western weapon systems that are deployed in Ukraine will end up. Um, certainly they will be captured just in the normal course of battle, but once they're captured, what happens to them? Well, Russia is certainly gonna get a hold of them. And if Russia gets a hold of them, where else will they go? It's think it's safe to assume that they'll go to China. Um, but the fact that if this reporting is correct, that Iran values access to those Western weapon systems enough to say, hey, look, instead of cash, we'll take this captured Western systems uh, from you is an interesting point. And this goes back to reporting previously where the US was going to provide gray eagles to Ukraine, and then that was pulled back. One, I think, safely can assume that the reason that the, the Great Eagles were not provided to Ukraine is because there are components and capabilities on those that are so sensitive that we cannot afford to lose them to Russia, Iran, and China. And this goes to doctrine and also just to do, due to experience. 
the United States is very accustomed to having air dominance. You know, if we, you know, we go in someplace, it's been our assumption up until now that we are going to control the airspace. And by putting our assets into that airspace, our risk of losing them to the opposition is relatively low. Um, one of the facts is that no one has air dominance in Ukraine. And so anything you put up in the air over there is likely to come down on the opposition side of the equation. Yeah, and I think uh, we saw a video, and I don't know how accurate it was, but it was maybe two weeks a bit back, and we may have posted in our in our closed group of what appeared to be a reverse engineered copy of the switchblade drones. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, between Russia, uh, Iran, and potentially if China, if they all work together, they would have certainly the capability to reverse engineer a lot of the materials if they already get them get their hands on them, or at least create some I countermeasures. Think, yeah, I think that switchblades, you know, once somebody shows the possibility of a switchblade, I think, you know, having one in hand to reverse engineer is, is easy. Uh, it makes it easier, but it's like, oh, wait a second, a tube launched, you know, yeah. loitering munition. Okay, I see how that works. We can go build one of our own. And I think China had, I saw a video coming out of China of a something that looked a lot like a switch levade, which was essentially tube launch. So reverse engineering makes some things much easier, but other stuff is just form follows function. It's like, oh, we see how this thing works. We can go build our own. Okay, so I'll jump to the next one. Uh, so this was an interesting uh, notice. Uh, so this is big news. Is, flat. Yeah, this is me coming from over five years of looking at potential UAS threats domestically and who's responding to them and things like that. Um, we we in the United States have been looking at Ukraine and looking at the Mexican drug cartels and ISIS and saying, oh, there's all these UAVs being used for malicious purposes outside the United States. Um, but with very, very few exceptions, there's no examples of malicious UAV use, you know, intentional malicious UAV use within the border of the United States. Um, there's some people such as myself who believe that that's been going on for a while. And we pointed to a Mavic that had some copper wires uh, below it that it's believed that the intention was to short out an electrical substation. Um, there's also a lot of suspicious UAV flights around US Navy ships off the coast of California uh, and Going back years, if you use FOIA information, we've seen UAV flights around petroleum facilities in Louisiana. So I find this reporting particularly interesting because the FBI director is now coming out and saying, we are tracking multiple potential incidents of malicious UAVs domestically. This is a real problem. And if you look at the bottom of the paragraph, or the leading paragraph, it says, and an, nope, right there, an earlier incident in March when a drone taking pictures of a Louisiana pipeline was discovered by law enforcement. If you look at, if you look back, and particularly if you filed FOIA requests on the various um, uh, law enforcement jurisdictions in that area, there have been drones flying over petroleum production facilities in Louisiana for several years now. So the FBI is now saying this is a threat, and hopefully. This helps push forward the National Action Plan for Counter UAS that the White House announced back in, I think, April. And the legislation for that is currently in Congress. We need to get that National Action Plan and the legislation associated with it approved so we get Counter UAS authority and we get a lot of the other things required so that we in the United States can start protecting critical infrastructure. Um, uh, public uh, events and things like that from malicious use of UAV. So this, I think, is a very interesting announcement and a very significant announcement by the FBI. Um, and hopefully it's uh, part of more information now coming up from the government about what's going on domestically. And just to highlight that before I get, I want to briefly talk about the drone carrier. And then if we have time, get into the drone lab of Ukraine because I think that's a really important question and it's related to this quote here. 
uh, you know, you can read it all now, it's highlighted, but there's one specific section and I'm gonna highlight that now since I've left this highlighted for a while, uh, but they suggest it's just a matter of time before a highly modified unmanned aircraft system is used in attack, in an attack. So, so I think, again, I would be on the side of people that say it's a question of when, not a question of if, when we're talking about the emerging threats of UAVs, UGVs, and other inhabited or unmanned systems being used in attack, which would will be the segue into the final section if I can just briefly talk about this. Uh, so this, again, we should have talked about this when I talked about Turkey, but the Turkish government has been investing in a, in a carrier that I believe was originally designed for the F-35 program, which they were booted out of uh, by the, the NATO partners that were involved, primarily the US, after they went through with the purchase of the S-400 missile system for Russia. And because of the purchase of that missile system, it put the program at risk because that missile system, it's installed by Russians. It has computer systems that may be linked to Russian intelligence. It may have cameras and all this kind of things that can feed intelligence uh, back to Russia. I mean, it will take years maybe for those trainers and staff from the Russian military who might be also Russian intelligence installing these things. So basically, it, it, it puts at risk the entire program, the F-35, if it's going to do any test flight or if there's anything going on in, in Turkey. So they were kicked out, they were warned, and they decided to go ahead anyways. And so what they did with this, they had this carrier. So what can they do with it? Uh, they decided to convert it into a TV2 drone carrier. So uh, this is an interesting idea because uh, it says here the novelty can, can constitutes one more in a growing list of tools with which Turkey can pursue its increasingly ambitious regional policies. Okay, however, because Turkey's drones remain vulnerable to modern air defenses, we argue that drone carriers have a place in low intensity war like proxy wars in Libya and Syria. Okay, that's for sure. I mean, if we look at the power projection and the military intervention of Turkey, it's largely focused on the MENA region and establish and, and a lot of it, one, to control the what it views as a threat from the various Kurdish groups, uh, two, to pursue its kind of vision of re-establishing itself as a leader, uh, as a great power in the Muslim world in the and across the MENA region. And then most importantly, the mineral rights and the gas and the oil that exists off the coast of Libya and around Cyprus and you know in, in the Mediterranean. Yep. So, so I, I, I just, I, yeah, your thoughts? No, I no, I think you've nailed most of it. And I think, you know, it's sort of most people's perception of Turkey's contribution to aviation, military, and things like that was the TB2. So clearly this is a step much farther than just yet another drone. So we're now talking, you know, drone motherships are, are interesting, but they are talking about building maritime military vessels at scale that then help project air power using their own UAV platform. So I think this is a very interesting thing to track. Um, in respect of our audience's time and our time, um, I think pivoting to, hey, one of the things that we need to pay attention with Ukraine is that it is a petri dish, it's a laboratory, it's a pressure cooker for a large amount of evolution in the UAV space, in the counter UAV space, in the operations space, in the tactics, tools and procedures space, all of these things for UAVs. Um, it's happening at light speed, it's happening in real time, and it's happening in an evolutionary era, uh, manner. You introduced me to a book called Dragons and Snakes, um, which I have found to be incredibly informative, particularly with respect to what's going on in Turkey, uh, with Hamas, and in Ukraine. And just to really sum it up, 
uh, the author says that combat and uh, you know nation state on uh, asymmetrical warfare against insurgents and things like that has tremendous evolutionary pressure, and we're seeing that right now in Ukraine. Um, and so, you might, if you want to mention a little bit about dragons and snakes and your thoughts on uh, the pressure cooker there, it'd be great. I would love to, uh, because uh, Dr. David Cullen is one of my professors, and also the the, the two books you wrote, Dragons and Snakes. It's also the, the next part of the title is How the West Learned to Fight the Rest. So it kind of summarizes what, you, what you're, you're going to expect to see. And largely how the West has underestimated the dragons, which are the, in its reference to uh, Woolsey's, James Woolsey, the former Secretary of State, was it, under the Clinton administration? who had said with the, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we have slayed the dragon and now there is, I'm paraphrasing here, it's time to focus on the snakes, the jungle of snakes, full of poisonous snakes, the snakes being the non-state actors. However, there are new dragons. If we're looking at the dragons or the, the, the state actors, especially the near and pure competitors, but also these regional actors that have reached that we're underestimating by deprioritizing the MENA region and focusing specifically on what they call renewed great power competition in you know, China, where the US is making a similar mistake again, you know, where it focused on the snakes instead of the dragons and allowed Russia and China to build the force that it did throughout the, the 90s and the early 2000s and throughout the 2000s. And then watch as the US engaged the snakes in Iraq with the insurgency and in Afghanistan and learn from the non state actors. And then those non state actors learned from the state actors. And so now we have a whole bunch of highly effective uh, hybrid state and non state actors who are also supporting each other with the combined goals of targeting the West and shifting the power away from the US and NATO and the multipolar world. Plus, we have the connectivity through social media and, and the internet, the advanced smartphones, all this kind of stuff. So that, that, that big laboratory that you're talking about in Ukraine is just being TikToked. All these new drones are being TikToked or they're being shared on Twitter and it's being uploaded and viewed and then stored forever on the internet as open source information. And now, Groups from all over the world are basically getting a magazine of inspirational ideas for how they can come up with cheap weapon systems that will require an enemy with a superior number, superior forces, superior funding to expend large amount of money to destroy these cheap weapon systems. And like if you look at a drone versus a helicopter, if you have a if you manage to make a COTS UAV into a loitering munition and cover it in a, you know, some kind of protective material or something and just launch it at a helicopter, that multi-million dollar helicopter is being taken out by a, I don't know, a couple thousand dollar drone, potentially, in theory, you know, yeah. or something so, like that. Let me circle back to something that you talked, so TikTok and things like that. Um, what's going on in Ukraine uh, through the evolutionary pressure for the evolution of all these systems? And also through the public relations efforts of everybody involved, Ukraine, Russia, and you know everybody is producing these videos. Uh, they're producing documentation. They're produce, producing STL files for 3D printers. All this very rich material about the evolution of all these systems is getting spread out through the internet and preserved. And everybody from China and Russia, these nation state peer adversaries for countries like the United States, all the way down to individual domestic violent extremists are consuming this material and saying, wait a second, this is applicable to my goals. And so China's looking at it and say, okay, how do Russian and US weapon systems work in this sort of environment and what's working, what's not? And individuals are saying, wait a second, I can take a Mavic 3 and 3D print this bomb release and make my own munition. So I think there's a future conversation and hopefully not too far in the future, along with a lot of academic reporting and things like that about not just Ukraine as this evolutionary pressure for the evolution, but also 
how how we are consuming the results of that evolutionary pressure, where is that information going, and what's that effect going to have on national security for every single country in the world going forward in the next couple of decades? And I think on that is one excellent point to end on. And I would just add one last thing. Uh, I highly recommend for anyone that hasn't read these books to give these books a read. But there's also a, a quick summary, a one-hour summary of each each of Dr. Kilcullen's books on YouTube when you type in the title. And he does like a Google talk and one, uh, something like that, where you, you can get the main points if you don't have time to read the whole book. Uh, and the main points of themselves will give you enough to think about, but I highly recommend reading the books because you can really get it. It gives you all of the specific details. A lot, there's a lot of information and it'll get your brain running. Uh, but the second thing is the, you know, talking about the rise and importance of non-state actors. That's something that we have to consider. And at this point, I think the West needs to look and see who are the non-state actors that we have partnerships with. And who can we develop partnerships with? Because the, the adversaries of the West already have partnerships with a number of non-state actors, violent non-state actors all over the world. And they're continuing to de develop them. Uh, and they come in different forms, whether it's Islamist and Takfiri groups, or whether it's a group like Wagner Group, the uh, mercenary, uh, whatever, private military contractors from Russia that, you know, give that kind of plausible deniability. And then now you add UAV technology and the, the, the close air support it gives, the ISR assets it can provide. And we have a very dangerous situation in the next 10, not even 10 years. Look at the rate of evolution, six months, two years, something like that. So Exactly. Yep. No, I and I think that... I, I think you're spot on, and I look forward to engaging with you and the rest of the community and really digging into that material. Um, I'd like to really thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation again, because now you've got my mind spinning and I've got more reading to do. Um, and I'd really like to commend We Think for creating the opportunity for you to have these conversations with myself, but also with a lot of other people. Um, and I really encourage anybody listening to this to go back through all of your materials and talk and the interviews that you've had with other people. And I really look forward to seeing your future conversations with people and who you get on the show. Thank you for the kind words. And, and I really appreciate you coming again uh, last minute. And uh, also just an update. We have finished phase two of the survey, uh, but this, the link will remain open. So if there are any, any, in, any more participants interested, if you can share with, academic institutions were really interested in getting the, the perspective of graduate students and beyond of all disciplines, because the more diversity of perspective we get, the more interesting, because we want to kind of emulate the innovation of non-state actors. Phase three will use the results of that survey to sort of inform the course, whoop, the, the course of action of our red team. Uh, and that's set to come in early 2023, so be on the lookout. We were thinking January. We're going to see. Uh, we will send out some. We will send out information to all of those who have already been participating and our partners. And if anyone is interesting, just interested, reach out to us via LinkedIn, social media, or you can email me. Uh, I've posted my email, Philip Philip O'Keefe at WeThink.eu. And in future, we're going to be looking at trying to get in a longer format for the, this uh, video episode and maybe try to even do a podcast so you can listen to it without having to look at us. Uh, so again, thank you, David, for, for everything. This I would love to discuss for hours and hours. Uh, and I have also more reading to do myself. And I look forward to... Uh, Discussing, discussing with you again in the future and any questions from the group and the to come. So thanks again, everyone, for watching. Dave, have a wonderful weekend. Uh, everybody else, you all have a wonderful weekend. And I don't know if I'm missing any holidays, but I think I belated Thanksgiving because I didn't catch it last time. So take care. And I'm going to try pause this now without making it awkward. And good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>